this is week two of the Human Action Study Group that we've got going on here at the Blockchain Institute We're doing Robert Murphy's study guide. Going through the study questions. It's uh, December 19th, 2018. Nice. Okay, so the first questions were... Um, Praxeology and history. What are the two main branches of the sciences of human action? Well, I think it's in the title, Praxeology and History. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Nice. And uh, what is the field of research of history? Can it tell us something about the future? So I just spend a lot of time um, going over what inductive and deductive reasoning was. Yeah. Um, because they use, was it priori and yeah. posteriori? Mm -hmm. um, so what I got out of it was priori is using deductive reasoning and posterior, posteriori is using induction. Mm -hmm. And so induction is when you start with you start with data and you come up with a law based on that data and so that's what history is history is just in uh, an arrangement of data and you're trying to sift through that to come up with a general law right yeah, he talks about like historians and how like a really good historian will be kind of impartial. They'll have to tell the story and leave some things out, but that's different from uh, a priori where the law that is like prescribed or ascribed is uh, comes from the definition of I don't know the, the words themselves. I, I don't. <laughs> I don't know exactly how to put it. So I think the conclu uh, go ahead. one way to think of history in this sense is if you think of statistics and taking measurements of, of something and then trying to um, create a, a rule about the data. Right. Like it's not you're deducing the rule. You're getting the rule after measuring things. And that's how people compute history in a way. They observe mm. different different things and then try to make up a rule based on that. Mm. But it's a posteriori because the rule comes after observing the the real world. In statistics, mm -hmm. you would have you would be able to have like a fit line, a function to some data. Uh, uh, but that's not truth. It's an approximation of truth. It, um, and yeah. it's a posteriori. He, he kind of talked about, or he did say that, like, Einstein um, was shocked by his, uh, by how closely his um, theories matched reality. And he was like, you know, can a human come to understand reality through reason alone? And, like, his conclusion was n no you can only have like all one or all the other um, and yeah. the more that a rule is in touch with the reality with reality the the less true it is and the more true something is the less in touch with reality like mathematics is right you completely can true because it's contrived um, logically but it doesn't actually bear on like what people measure in physics there's a difference. Yeah. Which is interesting. So, can history tell us something about the future? Or the research of history tell us something about the future? It seems like it can make an approximation, but it can't come up with a general law because it's not a complete data set. Yeah, I would say if it's a yes or no question, the answer is no. The answer is like yes with a caveat. Uh, yeah, 
it can predict the future a little bit, but... Well, it says something about the future. Yeah, that's so, true. So then, yes. Especially if we understand people's motivations. And the, first of all, if you understand what people's goals actually were, and then the more you understand how they reasoned about what was the effective way of achieving that goal, then you can predict more about their behavior. That's a good point. What's going to happen. Yeah. If you can understand the human action of history right. versus the events of history. So the third question, is it possible to establish an posteriori theory of human action with the aid of historical knowledge? So I guess, what would the definition of theory be? sense. The theory of human action? No, uh, is it possible to just an induct a posteriori theory of human action? Yeah. I would say no. What does that mean to you exactly? So a theory would be in the sense a set of equations or I guess a, a, a statement, just a true statement, I guess, that can be tested. Um, and I don't think you can make that statement based on history because history is an incomplete data set. You would only ever make that, as, that statement in some confidence interval, of, um, but it would never be correct, except for statistic within some parameters. Right. Okay, so section two. Uh, the formal and appropriistic character of praxeology. Mises states that the fundamental logical relations are not subject to proof or disproof. Why? Possibly because they are tautological, that they are correct by definition, in and of themselves, and they're mm -hmm. designed that way. It's they're they're designed in the same vein as mathematics and logic, and those of mathematics and logic are designed to exist only in the field of ideas and reasoning, and not in the physical world necessarily. Um, then again, mathematical there are such a thing as mathematical proofs. Yeah, mathematical proofs are only logical. They don't exist in the real world. But they're not subject yeah. to proof or disproof. Because there's axioms in uh, mathematics. So, like, uh, one equals one. Yeah. You can't prove that. You have to take it as, like, a fundamental uh -huh. assumption. Okay. So, like, and they, they talk a lot about the chapter... Um, all these axioms, like all these long-winded mathematical proofs are just a rearrangement of these fundamental basic um, axioms that we we take. Okay. So when it comes to like other things like human actions, there are these axioms or these, these fundamental logical relations that like we can build upon and create theory out of. That makes sense. And we do that because we find it useful to achieving our goals. Like, I guess if they're made up, one equals one is just assumed on faith. We, we're not like, a, we're not observing anything in the world. We can't like prove or have a, an experiment that one equals one. We just go on faith. I don't know. 
I don't know enough to say that we can or can't, but I would think my intuition tells me that we can prove that one equals one, that there can be a proof for that. No, I have other axioms. Oh, okay. I guess that's I mean more to nitpick. Yeah. But I am trying to understand. It's the concept of these like axioms which are just these assumptions like we have to make. Okay. Got it. What does he mean by methodological a prioriism? What he means is using using a method of using axioms at a base level to logically construct more and more subcategories of human action based completely on a priori um, rule sets. Okay. Without respect to any kind of historical observation, it will... So I'm, I assume that's what he's going to do throughout the book. Is study, he's explaining that there's axioms and then that there's going to be a method of, of understanding all of economics from a logical point of view instead of from any observational point of view. That makes sense. Okay. My favorite thing that he mentioned about that was um, that you can't understand prices or exchange or like a sale or uh, unless you understand, unless like they all come from these axioms and then the people are acting and Right. Absent context, there's no such thing as a, a sale and, and or like, a, and, the yeah. money. Yeah, and the, like those are based on axioms that are based on like more simple axioms going down. He was saying that uh, like money would look sort of like just people passing metal around without the context of uh, monetary theory. interest rates yeah all right so uh, why is it fallacious to pretend that the logical structure of the mind of primitive man is different from that of civilized man why is it fallacious to pretend that the logical structure of the mind of primitive man is different from that of civilized man uh, this is pretty easy for me to understand. It's just like, like the example they used was, you know, someone doing a rain dance. Yeah. And in our heads, that's like, that's silly, that's superstitious. But, you know, we probably do a ton of things that are silly and superstitious that we just don't know about. And they got into... You know um, how apes like they started at this like really based like logical mind that had to develop like it evolved like our logic kind of center like developed so I thought it was really interesting to think about we think we have figured out logic like we've hit like okay we we've discovered lo logic versus we're still kind of understanding logic and it's like we're still evolving in that sense yeah and, and the rationalization mm -hmm. is the same so in in case of primitive and more civilized we still have the same goal yeah right if, of growing more crops being more fed and it's just that the choices the set of, of possible actions that they had to them versus the set of possible actions that we are aware of is different. There's, those was either smaller or they didn't choose the right possible action. Yeah, using better fertilizer and more. Right, that was there. Yeah. That possible option. Mm -hmm. But also doing a rain dance or giving a candle to your patron saint. They just had, they had had less time of recording people trying a thing and then seeing the result. Yeah. And now we have, we have all this evidence to bear so we can make better decisions. Does action imply that it attains the end aimed at? No. 
We just talked about that. Oh, the a priori and reality. Can a prioristic reasoning enlarge our knowledge? Yes. What's a prioristic reasoning? Like deducing things from their definitions. I would think it's like the this book will increase our knowledge, even though it doesn't tell us fundamentally anything new that we didn't know before. It's just that it's laying it out in a logical way to illuminate concepts that had not been at the front of our minds before. Is that, I mean, that makes am I understanding it the same way as everyone else? Why would one think that a prioristic reasoning might not be able to expand our knowledge? Because the axioms are already there. So you could say, you know, we're just rearranging stuff that we already know, but it's like rearranging it in a useful way that we can build upon. Plus, mixing it with new ideas, mm -hmm. like like applying these axioms to different situations in actual life, and thinking about them is like evolves our knowledge. Well, uh, yeah, and I would think about it in the Socratic context, where Socrates, when dialoguing with people, never introduced new concepts to them; only used the concepts that they already knew. And then they, through their own conversation, would arrive at new ideas and new new knowledge. Uh, why do the sciences of human action differ radically from the natural sciences? Because natural science is a posteriori. Everything is observed through creating a test and doing something and observing the results. And like in the scientific method, they do use a hypothesis, which is like a uh, a priori rule, but it's something that they're really just testing and it's not, it's not really a given. And yeah, and I think it talks a lot about um, a lot of the natural sciences that, nat that use experiments where they hold everything constant and then change one thing, mm -hmm. where that's not possible in um, the study of human action. Yeah, it's harder to do experiments on real life. Right. Or know all the variables. Uh, why can't history teach us any general rule, principle, or law? I think we definitely went over this. Yeah, I think um, so too. Because it's always an approximation. Mm -hmm. um, that people's perspective can, uh, is always debated anyway. Right. I just think uh, what really helped me understand this was actually looking at like a math proof where like generally induction, you prove that if it's possible for P of N and then it's possible for P of N plus one and it's possible for everything. And the problem is that you can't um, you can easily do that like on a number line, but you can't really. I can't verbalize what I'm trying to think, but I thought it was, like if you're struggling with it, I would just look up an inductive math proof to help me understand it. Hmm. Helped you understand. The difference between just like this all is about inductive and deductive reasoning. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So. I think like once I understood that, I got this section. So that is to say then that a deductive proof, a deductive reasoning can never be used to form a general rule. No, that's not true. Deductive reasoning? 
It's uh, the only thing that can... Sorry, um, where if you're just observing things. Oh, yeah. Oh, and then you deduce yeah. that this is the case? To yeah. Them, that, that cannot. There are proofs that um, use inductive reasoning to come up with a... Like, you can use inductive reasoning. Okay, inductive reasoning. Is right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, you can use that. It's just uh, the way it's commonly done in like, a math proof is you prove it it's you have this base case you start with the base case so um one is greater than two and then like if you can prove that like or you start with the base case and then you prove that it's possible for the next case or n plus one and then if it's possible for n plus one then it's possible for all the values right so the problem is, like, when it comes to, like, reality, it's not like a number line. The, the search space is so, it's in infinite dimensions. So you can't, you just can't use, you, like, unless we had a complete data set, we couldn't um, come up with a general rule. Because there's just too many. Especially for human behavior. Like, we... We can't even measure what people's actual goals are. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, when people vote, you have no idea why they voted. Like, mm -hmm. maybe they, like, it doesn't mean they supported the candidate. It doesn't mean they were against anyone else. It doesn't mean they even wanted. You have no idea why they, they voted. Yeah, so. Hey, speaking of that, it's a good segue. <laughs> Can a collective whole act? <laughs> Why not? Well, that question answers the first question. No, a collective whole cannot act. Why not? Uh, because individuals act. Only individuals act. And even when collectively as a whole people are voting, it's still individuals who are pulling that lever. So one thing I thought about to play devil's advocate, can't, couldn't you abstract from the collective, like, couldn't you say black people vote for, like, this percentage, like, is that useful to abstract away the individual using collectives? Yeah. Seems like it could be useful. Yeah. Okay. I think that's valid. But it's not that blacks act. Blacks is right. not a concept that is acting. It's only the individual's within that group who can do the acting. It's still... And, and that's really because we define the idea of a desire uh, as something that's within an individual's mind. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but if, if, like, if a goal is something that's shared among a body of people somehow, is that... Are they able to act? I think it removes autonomy because, you know, if, you're, if you start talking about groups that way, then it's almost like they don't have a choice. Um, they can't choose to act. It's like saying like, red, uh, white blood cells attack bacteria. It's like, by definition, that's what they do. And there's no bl white blood cell out there that's just like, nah, -uh, I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna go with the crowd. Yeah. But couldn't you say like, uh, so you can't say that a group acts, but you could say 75% of them do something. Yeah, but that's like and saying 75 people acted. And that's just a different group. I don't know, if, so if everyone in the group acts. You could say a percentage of this one group does this. Uh, so you have two people, two teams playing t tug of war, two groups. And say 60% of one group pulls and only 20% of the other group pulls. You could say like that group is acting and pulling pulling the rope further. I think you could only say that that group of the people who are actually pulling the rope are is the group that's acting to pull the rope. Okay. And if you have other people who are not doing that in there consciously not pulling the rope, then, yeah. then I don't think you can say that about the group.
Praxeology concerns the actions of individuals. It is true that people may behave differently when they view themselves as members of a nation or when in the midst of an unruly mob. Even so, the nation does not bomb them their country. Individuals in the armed forces choose to obey such orders. Mm. Yeah, this doesn't. Th this summary doesn't answer your uh, objection. Like, um, I, I buy the fact that, like, yeah, individuals are enough. Is it useful? But can you use collectives to make generalizations? Like, generalizations. Yeah, but those generalizations are not going to be like factual things, and they're like. Oh, okay. And so they're weak. They're weak building blocks in logic in logical deduction of further understanding of action and economics like that. but you can have if you take a survey of I, I don't know the exact numbers you take a third survey of 10,000 people in America a random survey um, like with statistical like um, evidence that you, you can know that your answers are correct within a certain band of variance so you can build on that it just it makes it it lose it's not I guess it's not using reason logic anymore it's using more uh, probabilities right and like if you think about how he's going to go from very basic axioms all the way up to like huge complex theories yeah the, like the more uh, statistical variance you have within your theory like it compounds and becomes like exponentially right. more off from the truth. If you're you, if you're constantly using these statistical deductions, that makes sense. So he needs to be a hundred percent reason based, or it's, it's at least logical. It's at least very useful to understand the whole tree of reason and yeah. logic, and without without ever trying to insert statistics. Yeah, and then but then like once you understand that, applying statistics to that framework is way more awesome. Right. Why is it necessary to examine collective wholes through an analysis of individuals' actions? Because only individuals act. Until there is a conscious, a collective consciousness that can verifiably speak English, and, and like we can definitely distinguish it from. A person speaking, like, then we we have no proof that there's a consciousness outside of an, an, any individual at all. Like we can queer, I, we can query each other and pretty much assume that there's consciousness that can make decisions, and that's why we're even talking about human action. But if like, if there's not a consciousness outside of an individual, it's tough. Why is the acting and choosing being always an ego? Why is the acting and choosing being always an ego? An ego is something that has itself in mind. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. And so even if we collectively act, each of us has uh, our own interest in mind. It may be shared, but there are two independent um, wills to be done. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. Yeah. Good. Um, Even if you queried people, you, if you polled them and asked them their, their opinion, it doesn't mean that that's what their actual desire was. Like, so on a statistical level, maybe going back to that, yeah. you can never know what their actual aim was. It, they could say one thing. Right. Okay, yeah. Example? Any 
anyone ever vote like poll for like why? I don't know. Why do you support X candidate or like why are you voting on this? Yeah, they'll often say that it's one thing and that it it may in truth be another, and that that truth may be unknown even to themselves. Like, what so goal do saying? they actually have in mind with this? Okay. Their goal is probably, like, look good to my peers. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a possibility. So I think if, like, the negative of this was true, um, would it, if it wasn't always an ego, I think then, like, human action breaks down because uh, you're no longer acting to ease your uneasiness or solve your uneasiness. Right. So this has to be true or else um, human, like, uh, it's not human action. What is it? Collective action or something? Just that uh, well, if human action isn't true, like, oh. it's... The basis for acting, so why is acting? So the basis of acting, you need to have the three states. You need to, um, you need to be in a position of uh, uneasiness. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to see a better state. Mm -hmm. And then you need to have the imagination on how to get from point A to point B. So... And only an, an ego can yeah, do that. Yeah, an e like an ego would do that. If, it, if you didn't do it for yourself, then you'd have no motivation to go from a state of uneasiness to, by definition, you're removing the uneasiness from yourself. Right, got it. That makes sense. And also an ego is separate from like how an, an animal would automatically try to solve a problem for themselves. Uh, it's like, it's something that's thinking. Mm -hmm. And it's thinking about itself. Mm -hmm. Yep. Five. The principle of methodological singularism. What does the act of choosing always imply? Hmm. There's a comment here. A man never chooses between gold and iron in general, but always between a definite quantity of gold and a definite quantity of iron. So the act of choosing implies options? The act of choosing implies specificity. Ah, right. The specificity of the options? Right. Okay, so it implies that there's more than one option. Definitely. <clears throat> Praxeology deals with individual actions, not vague action in general. Think uh, Those who think in terms of universals fall into traps, such as the classic water-diamond paradox. What is the price, or why is the price of diamonds higher than the price of water, when the latter is more important. So, hmm, okay. What are the two aspects of every action? There's a desire for improvement and a choice between methods of, of achievement. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Six, the individual and changing features of human action. How do inheritance and environment direct a man's action? Environment definitely directs your uneasiness. So it's cold out here now. Mm -hmm. 
I, I feel cold and it's bad. And so now I'm generating all these ideas of possible action to, to make that better for me. And inheritance, like, oh, I was born to a blacksmith. I'm probably going to solve my problems like a blacksmith. Like, I need clothes. I'm going to do blacksmith stuff to get clothes. Or I'm part of a Christian sect. I'm going to do Christian stuff to get clothes. Right, so it, it <laughs> impacts the possible choices that you see for achieving the goal. So not, not only what you desire is impacted by inheritance and environment, but how you achieve that desire. Yeah, also, if, I like how Mises put that, like, every man, when you're born, is the product of, like, all the inheritance of all the decisions of every ancestor and everything event that has happened on Earth up until that point. And then, like, then you get to choose after, at a certain point after that. But uh, we're all inheritance from there. Is this where he talks about the common man? <clears throat> or is that later on? Like, uh, he goes... Oh, yeah. He talks about the common man and how... He, I think he even said that most people are just common yeah. men who make, like, our blacksmith because their parents are blacksmiths, or... I don't think I fully understood exactly what the point of defining a common man was. Um, he defined a common man in, in contrast to the very few men who can think new thoughts and break the mold from the patterns of the world that they are born into. So would that mean that if that's the case, then inheritance and environment are extremely important in yeah. human action? Yeah. Because if only a select few are going to break their environment or break like what they inherited and change, then for the large majority, like that's what drives their human action. Yeah. Most men by definition are common men okay. by definition yeah and he call, he call, even calls them sheep which I giggled, <laughs> I giggled at a little bit. Um, how is praxeology oh how does praxeology deal with routine is it due to conscious acting and to a deliberate choice um, well, they talk about the example of water being clean, like if you're born into a clean area, um, your choice, you won't be choosing to bathe and, and drink a lot of water, like that'll just be the basic thing that you do and are raised up in. But then when your environment changes and you're in a bunch of bad water, um, you're going to be really careful and do conscious acting, and make deliberate choices to be really careful not to drink the water. Yeah, and I think that this kind of, at least, I think we had the wrong definition. I think last week we even said that um, a routine wasn't a human action. Mm -hmm. At least that, that's what my understanding was. What Derek said was, if you choose... Up, the action is upon choosing the routine, right? And and in, and making it a routine, but then at that point you're saying it wasn't action. That was yeah, that was my understanding. But now I would say it is action. Um, to like so, if you have a, a routine of da uh, bathing daily, even though you don't think about it because you have clean water, it's still an action. I think we, we like you think you brought up yoga. Um, you kind of just show up at yoga, and I think we said that it wasn't an action. But I think, based on this chapter, you would say that it is an action. Yeah, and we might qualify it as um, some things are conscious actions, 
and some things are unconscious actions, like a routine that you're not even aware of is an unconscious action. It's still an action. Yeah. Well, it, it wasn't my goal to do yoga. Um, it, I had a goal in mind, and, and so I was thinking about that. It wasn't that I was, like, I wasn't thinking at all, because if my goal in mind leaves my mind, then I stop going to yoga. Mm -hmm. But if I have that goal that yoga is going to achieve, then it's automatic. So it's still action because I have something I'm trying to achieve. Right. Seven, the scope and the specific method of history. Can one present history without any value judgments? Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Bitcoin. What about it? It is the... Oh, it's... It's, <laughs> it's history, like... It's some type of history of the exchange of bitcoins. Yeah, it's an order of actions. It's an order, so that that is history. I mean, just like, I mean, the the reasons behind the actions, maybe not, but, and that's like a historical data set. That, okay, Would so that, is history to just record facts as measure yeah. So yeah. I guess that's a, you can argue the history of the definition of history then. So what is history? Is it everything that ever happened? No. I, isn't it everything that ever happened within the realm of human action? N not always. There's all, all kinds of different history. He says that historians have to admit some things because you can't record every goddamn thing in the world. You have to be silent about some things. Like, even reporters who are reporting on a story that happened yesterday have to admit some things because it's just not critical to the story. And that there is a value judgment. Like even, uh, even creating history, you're choosing what to say and what not to say because if you were going to be impartial, you would have to say everything that you ever observed. Yeah. Which is like, just, it would be unending talk and you wouldn't be able to observe much. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're, making a value judgment based on what happened. Yeah, even the blockchain emits some of the history because it doesn't tell you what I bought or where the mo who the money was going to. There are certain things that it leaves out. It is a complete, is, I guess it's an incomplete history. And how can you even make how how value really tell the story of Bitcoin without, make, like, if you just look at the blockchain, it's really just arrangement of electrons within a silicon circuit and like how can you really say what that is without like tons and tons of value judgments yeah a human yeah, written code like what why bitcoin even it involves all these well, things it's a so if people didn't exist in I mean, there's stuff that surrounds Bitcoin, but don't we? In order to even tell the story of Bitcoin, we have to know something about the motivations of everyone ever like involved, and and for that to be the case, we have to have a, stu a study of emotion of praxeology and motivations and. And behavior but can't you just study it as just a pure system so you're just saying like a bunch of silicon wafers just started ranging in this form all over the earth like and that's what the blockchain is yeah I guess yeah maybe I need to work on that thought that's cool. maybe the question can be answered with the answer to the next question, which is, what is always the genuine problem of historians? And I would think it's knowing wh what to admit and knowing how to frame the history so that it's useful to the reader. And that's dependent on his or her understanding of the events and people's motivations, which he doesn't truly know. I think that gives historians 
too much credit. I would say they can't measure everything, so they can't report on it. I'd say there's a giant set of facts, and I'd say historians know a very, very tiny subset of that, and then they only report an even tinier subset of what they know. So I think the largest problem is they don't know everything. That makes sense. They know nothing. Pretty much. Yeah, relatively. So, they can, like, even if they reported everything they know, and, like, every single tiny fact, it, it'd still be nothing. So can history be scientific? Maybe the study of it can be, if you had a complete... So, if you have the data, then you can find out anything. So you can have... It can be the science of studying a theoretical complete data set, but you'll never have that theoretical complete data set. Isn't science, you have to design something and create the theory beforehand. Yeah, you can't repeat the history, so yeah. you can't repeat the Yeah, experiment. you have to design it beforehand, and then with control, <coughs> you perform the experiment, and then observe what happened. So not without a time machine. With a time machine, perhaps, history could be scientific. Am I wrong about that, that like definition of science? Yeah, I think, uh, so that's the definition of natural sciences, and I think a really main point of this chapter was that um, that ex that doesn't work just because that doesn't work from human action doesn't mean that human action and that's what natural scientists uh, commonly uh, like that's a common discouragement of like the study of human action because it it doesn't follow their methodology the way they do it mm -hmm. But I think a main point was that there are other methodologies to create theories. Okay, that makes sense to me. I can see other methodologies that yeah. are at least as valid. Right. Um, because if you have measurements from the past, you can basically do experiments through time with them. Yeah. And even if you didn't mean to do an experiment before, Why can't we measure any constant relations between magnitudes in the field of economics? I always hear, an ounce of gold bought you a nice suit a thousand years ago, and an ounce of gold buys you a nice suit now. It seems to contradict. That statement. Though even the definition of nice is subject to sub like to different interpretations and like some someone might think twelve hundred dollar suit that's garbage. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> or um, it, it seems that because economics is based on praxeology mm -hmm. that. It, everything is so subjective and it's hard to you, you can't compare values except for ordinarily in your own mind when trying to achieve a specific goal like really the only way the only time that praxeology compares values is say you have five options of things to do to achieve your goal you compare them ranked you know one through five and generally choose the number one but it's like impo it's impossible for you to even compare your choices to someone else's choices in their brain. Okay. Just give you a little minute. I'm gonna turn the heat up a little bit. Got a little cold in here. Why is action always speculation? So I 
I think it's because we don't have a... It goes to the... There's no definite law um, that we can derive from for human action. So... We can never know that this action will get me to this. You never know that action will take you to your means. You can only say that this action will be the best action to take me to the means. Like there's not a situation where you can say with 100% confident, if I do this, that will happen. That's fair. I think it will happen. Pretty Basically. sure. Mm -hmm. Or I'm taking a big chance. But this seems like the best. What if you were... What if you're just 100... What if you're an idiot and you're 100% confident? <laughs> I'm gonna go buy... A billion lottery tickets. Uh, because the thing hasn't I'm happened yet. So like, because okay. it happen, hasn't happened yet, like, you're still acting before it happens. So it's not, okay. isn't guaranteed. I don't know, so even if you think it's guaranteed. But isn't action, so it's the ego acting. So maybe to me, I'm not speculating, <coughs> but to, Someone analyzing me, I'm speculating. But I don't think, like, if you just had a, like people with faith, like they do something, like they have a hundred percent belief. Is it fair to say that's speculation? It could yeah. just be wrong. Yeah, it totally is fair to say it's speculation. Like, it's very confident speculation. Like. Maybe we should look up exactly what speculation is, but I think it's like thinking a thing is going to happen. Speculation. Now, the forming of a theory or conjecture without firm evidence. So faith is exactly uh, speculation. Okay. You think something's going to happen, but... <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Historical facts are unique and unrepeatable, yet what do they have in common? The comment is, the physicist transforms a historical event into a fact of the empirical nature of natural sciences. He disregards the active interference of the experiment and tries to imagine him as an indifferent observer and relater of unadulterated reality. When it comes down, all historical facts have in common the fact that they were presented by a value-judging person, and that they were filtered, all historical facts are filtered through a choosing mind before being presented. Maybe by definition. In here. contrast to an, a, a physicist, what a physicist, how a physicist presents historical facts? Is that what you're saying? That wouldn't be history, though. It would be... what? It would be measurement? He disregards the active interference of the experimenter uh, and tries to imagine him as an indifferent observer and relater of unadulterated reality. Okay. So you're saying that the what historical facts have in common, even though they're all uh, unique and unrepeatable, is that they are presented through the eyes of an active observer. Even a physicist is, is telling you, you, we're assuming these axioms about the universe, and we can draw these conclusions based on what I'm saying. Like, 
and he's, uh, he's telling you to disregard all the things you don't know and all the unproven theorems that exist out there. And so it's definitely presented through his filter. That makes sense. 10, the procedure of economics. Comment, quote, no being of human descent that pathological conditions have not reduced to a merely vegetative existence lacks knowledge of the essence of human action. No special experience is needed in order to comprehend these theorems, and no experience, however rich, could disclose them to a being who did not know a priori what human action is. Because the end of science is to know reality, what does this imply for the proper procedure of economics? Uh, just to unpack it a little bit, I'd say, so the end of science is to know reality. So that's the same thing as like an omnipotent being. Like uh, God yeah. doesn't need science, he just, he just knows. So we're not omnipotent, so we don't just know. So we have to follow you know, scientific method to understand economics. So, yeah, well, how does it relate to economics? Uh, yet, the end of science is to know reality, and so praxeology restricts its inquiries to those cases where the preconditions could be achieved in the real world. So it's that hum it's that uh, perhaps that the proper procedure of human of um, economics is to study the real world, to study actions that, in reality. So there's a constraint placed on economics and the study of human action that because we are trying to understand reality, then it's only based in things that human, like the actual human mind can comprehend. So it doesn't talk about anything that the mind, the human mind can't possibly think um, yeah, and as, a, as a things outside of that realm. Yeah, and it's without value judgment. It's without, it's, it's, you know, science doesn't place a value on, you know, the rate at which a ball falls to the earth. And similarly, a study of economics shouldn't put a value judgment on whether one person chooses a thing or another. It's, that's just the reality. The limitations on praxeological concepts. What happened when philosophers and the theologians attempted to apply praxeological categories to an absolute being who was not constrained as human actors are? Well, action doesn't apply to an omnipotent being because he wouldn't have any discomfort, first of all. Right, I think they said, in, and if he did, or it did, in one swoop, it would cure it. And as yeah. soon as he realized that <laughs> yeah. it would be done, he wouldn't be choosing the options at all. Right. He just makes it so. Well, congratulations, guys. We did it in one hour. All right, we nice. did it. Now we can go to Hot Pilates. <laughs>